Well, hello there, and welcome to this edition of the DMZ America podcast. It is Thursday, May 4th, 2023. This is episode 100. <laughs> I'm Scott Stannis coming to you from the right. And I'm Ted Rall coming to you from the left. We're going to talk more about the podcast and why we did it, why we decided to do it, and how we got to this point, which, you know, uh, we did not have any expectations or um you know, we did, we said, we're going to have 100,000 followers within six months. We just, we really are just putting it out there. And uh, the response has been, frankly, Ted, overwhelming, given that we just do it through our own meager social media. And that's, that's it. True. That is all we do. Yeah, we, uh, I, I myself, I only post the podcast to my uh, Twitter and Facebook feeds. And I do it once a week. Uh, and that's it. Oh, and on my blog, of course. Um, but yeah, once a week and then we get people it's word of mouth. So thank you for listening. We appreciate oh, very it. much. Yeah. We love you guys. Thank you. Um, so this week, <laughs> Ted forwarded me this morning, this, this, um, column by Gail Collins of the New York times, uh, apparently every column, how many columnists they must have like thousands of columnists. It just seems like it. Yeah, but no good ones to paraphrase. Uh, no, she. This sucks, Ted. This is awful. It is pretty. The headline is repulsed by Biden and Trump. Tough. <laughs> and it goes on to say, you know, effectively, uh, too many and too many options can screw up an election. Yes, it's like <laughs> well, democracy benefits from less choice. I've always found <laughs> democracy is always best when it's a one party state. Well, it makes it's it keep makes the democracy more streamlined. Um, it does. It keeps get takes the guess totally totally takes the guesswork out. So people like Gail Collins can write shitty columns and then go have a gin Collins, I guess, or whatever she drinks. Um, here's the thing that bothered. I mean, okay, hard to honestly, believe that she used to be a progressive. You know, was she really? Oh yeah, she was a she was the co a, a very gifted columnist at the Daily News in New York, uh, and then they had a brutal, extremely contentious strike. And uh, I believe this was the late eighties. And, uh, and during that strike, uh, a lot of, uh, it went on for a long time, months. Um, there were uh, several columnists, including Bob Herbert, who was also there, who went over to the New York times from the daily news. Uh, they were poached during the strike. And over the years, she has, you know, unsurprisingly, maybe because she's growing older, maybe because of the rarefied air at, West 43rd Street and now wow. 8th Avenue. Um, it, but I, I suspect more of the latter. You know, she knows what she's supposed to write. And so she does. So is she, so is she's a corporatist Democrat? Well, she is. Oh, she has been for quite some time. Yeah. Wow. Wow. <laughs> but, okay. I'm yeah, just shocked because she would have been a Bernie person. Reading this column was just like um, she cites this is this is this is how this is how fucking stupid the column gets people. And um, she's talking about a race in Montana. And the GOP apparently dropped $100,000 uh, to get the Green Party candidate onto the ballot, uh, which they were successful in doing. And so with the idea, of course, that they, that would somehow dilute the, the, the Democratic part candidate's vote. Well, the Democratic candidate won anyway. So she says, I mean, she she goes on to say it didn't work. But this is just another example of how this can fuck up an election. I'm going, it's exactly the opposite of that, you idiot. It is the exact opposite of the point you're trying to make, which was. You know, that the, the GOP got these candidates to run against and it diluted the Democratic vote and hence the Democratic candidate failed. The Democratic Party, the party, the nominee did not fail. They won. They won, Ted. So what the hell is she talking about? Help me to understand. I you know, don't get it. If she had an editor, which she clearly does not, the editor would have said, Gail, what's with this? This doesn't make any sense. You know, this this does not make your point at all. Um there's been there's so much, but basically, to the 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 thesis of her piece is that there should be no one next year should even consider voting for a third party, even though most voters do not want uh, most Democrats don't want Biden to run. Um, about half of Republicans don't want Trump to run. Most Americans, voters overall, overwhelmingly, two out of three don't want either of these guys to run. Nobody wants this 1892 style rematch. Um, and so 
uh, people are looking at other choices and hoping that there might be a third party. People have been talking about this Joe Lieberman outfit, no labels, but you know, obviously there's the Greens, there's the Libertarians, there's the Socialist Workers, there's the Revolutionary Communist Party, there's a lot of other uh, small parties that uh, people are may be considering. And she's trying to nip that in the bud. And she's like, uh, she, she just says like, don't do it. Do not. Oh, Here's no. The thing. Here's an important early message. Even if you aren't thrilled by the Republican and, Dem and Democratic options come election day, don't vote for anyone else. So we're talking here about the attraction of third parties. So tempting, so disaster <laughs> inducing. I and oh, oh, she also there's a lie in here, too. Uh, there's the way so many people did in 2016 when Trump won the presidency, thanks to the Electoral College votes of Pennsylvania, Michigan and Wisconsin. OK, that's true which Hillary Clinton probably would have carried if the folks who were appalled by Trump had voted for her instead of the Libertarian or Green Party candidates. Okay, so first of all, uh, conventional wisdom would say that Libertarians are not going to vote, are more likely no, to God, no. votes away from Republicans than from Democrats, and Greens yes. more likely to the other way around. Yes. Anyway, the point is, this assertion has been, I've tried to drive a stake in through it. So I was curious about it. And back in, I don't know, 2016, I looked at the final count, vote tallies for Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Wisconsin. And assuming that every single person who voted for Jill Stein, the Green Party candidate, had would instead voted for Hillary, she would have picked up one state, Michigan. She still would have lost Pennsylvania and Wisconsin, meaning that she still would have lost the Electoral College, which means this is false. And that's assuming something that's completely ridiculous, which is that uh, Jill Stein's votes naturally belonged to Hillary Clinton. Most people who vote for a third party would either vote for that third party or not at all. Yes. That's yeah. how yeah. it is. So yeah. um, so it's just complete, but it's just wrong. I mean, there's, there's no... There's very few examples in American Electoral College history where a third party spoiler or, you know, had a, uh, which I, is a word I hate, really had a, a, a major effect on the outcome. I would say, I would argue Ross Perot did in 1992. Absolutely. Um, I would say uh, certainly Theodore Roosevelt in 1912. Yes. Uh, no question that, uh, you know, he would have... Uh, Taft would have prevailed if uh, yeah. Roosevelt hadn't hadn't. But and I mean, frankly, and frankly, yeah. that would have changed American history for the better. But true. Do you yeah. think? Um, do you think there's any other examples? Or oh, what of a third party having? A, I mean, uh, Eugene oh, Debs when he ran in nineteen was it the sixteen or the twenty election where he, he didn't he, run he, sixteen. He he so twenty. Well, he from jail. Yes, which is great. So we, Donald Trump might do the same thing, uh, but Eugene Debs uh, pulled a million votes. But did now, it, it didn't change the outcome, though. I mean, Harding. No, Woodrow won. Wilson still won. So I mean, and if it's twenty, then yeah, I mean, Harding was going to win. I mean, come on, you no know, matter was, what. Yeah, he. You had had four years of really shitty, shitty leadership under Woodrow Wilson. James Cox. Yeah, James Cox and Cox's running mate Roosevelt. FDR. Franklin Franklin D. Yeah, isn't that amazing? That is amazing. Yeah, I mean, you could, it's really kind of cool think, to see. So pictures. I think really only 1912, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, right? Like 1912, um, 92. That's um, it? Uh, I'm trying in to modern think. modern era? In 68, it almost did because uh, George Wallace ran as a Dixiecrat and took away the Solid South. So I probably had a, probably did not allow Hubert Humphrey to defeat um, Richard Nixon in 68. Do you think do you think Wallace took more votes away from the Democrats than from the yeah. Republicans? Yeah, back then, don't forget it was a solid Democratic vote down in the South, American South. They had yellow dog Democrats, you know, people who were former Dixiecrat, you know, the Dixie it was kind of the what yeah, the Republican right. Party is now. You had Dixiecrat type candidate who were also, you know, they ran as Democrats, but they were Dixiecrats. All right. Um, so uh, yeah, I'd say the 68 election was was impacted by that. Um so it, it can happen. Yeah. But but is it bad? Is the question. Well, did Anderson affect the 1980 election when he ran as a third party? Uh, did he take enough votes away from Jimmy Carter to allow Ronald Reagan? Well, I think Ronald Reagan I think, won in I a think, landslide, though. It's so, hard to say with Anderson because you know he was more conservative than people remember. Right. Um, he, well, he was a Republican congressman from Illinois, 
So, and yeah. you know, he was so far right that he once, this is one of my favorite stories. I don't know if you know it, Scott, he sponsored as a young congressman in the late 1960s, a congressional, uh, sorry, a constitutional amendment to declare Jesus Christ, the titular head of the United States. John Anderson did this. Yes. John Anderson did that. Wow. Holy crap. He came well, to my high school and I called him out on it. And he said, he basically, you know, uh, ducked the question and answered the question and he had media training. So he answered the question that he wished he'd been asked. Oh. Uh, yes. My wife is beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for asking. It's so funny. You mentioned the communist party because on the 76 election, I worked on the Jerry Ford uh, speakers bureau in Wisconsin and in Madison. So we had a lot of debates at the university of Wisconsin campus and they would just pile on to me and the guy who was representing the Carter campaign. But there's like three or four different communist party groups represented. And one of them was, well, what's As that? If it were it? France, they're the Stalinists. They think that Joe Stalin was just a victim of bad press. <laughs> I just to this day I'll never forget that quote. It's like that's awesome. Okay, yeah, that poor Joe, just fake news. He was actually just Jake. He was. You don't hear pet. that every day. Well, you <laughs> know my, my 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 favorite my favorite uh, uh, Stalin story is uh, in Khrushchev's memoirs. He talks about the surviving the 1937 1938 purges. Uh, the show trials in Russia. And at that time, the way it typically went down is there'd be some fucking party plenary meeting in, you know, bumfuck Ural. And then some asshole would stand up and say like, comrade Scott Stantis is not true revolutionary communist. He is Trotskyite running dog. He is a <laughs> capitalist roader. And then they would, and then, and then like the next day, it'd be like, <laughs> so the NKVD would come and pick you up. And if you were lucky, you were sent off to Siberia to a gulag, or more likely you'd just be brought down to the basement of a building and shot in the back of the head. And like, so anyway, um, so Khrushchev got wind that he had been denounced. And he oh. was like, so he was like, holy shit. He was, he was the party boss, if I, if memory serves, of uh, Odessa, I think, which uh, of course was in the Soviet Union. So he went to, so he didn't know what to do, but finally he decided to go to, to Moscow and confront Stalin directly. So he walk, he gets a meeting with Stalin because he was a big enough official to get that meeting. He walks in, puts his pistol on Stalin's desk and says, hey, motherfucker. If you want me dead, at least have the fucking decency to shoot me yourself. I've always been grateful. I've always been loyal to you, to the to the party, and to the Soviet Union. But if you think I'm not, kill me now. And Stalin looked at him and said, you know, I have your death warrant right here on my desk and showed it to him. He's like, but since you came to me, we're good. Let's drink vodka. So as they're drinking... Stalin turns to Khrushchev and goes, you know, things are getting really crazy. Some asshole even denounced me. <laughs> Imagine. Oh, the nerve. Yeah. <laughs> well, OK, so Gail Collins, you can go to hell. I mean, I'm, that's all I can say. We here's the thing I endorsed. I worked on the Chicago Tribune editorial board. I was on and we endorsed Gary Johnson in the 2016 election. You know why? Because Hillary sucked. And Donald Trump sucked. Uh, Gary Johnson was a libertarian who reflected our values at the time. Uh, mm -hmm. It was we, we still catch hell. I still catch hell for that endorsement. I still stand by it, which pisses people off. How can you say that you handed the election to Hillary? Well, first and foremost, I think you should be proud of your of that decision. Yeah, it's, um, I mean, look, here's here's another thing that's important, right? We're always told the same malarkey, the same bullshit. Like if. Uh, you know, this election is so important, most important election of our entire life, blah, blah, blah. They're all the most important elections of our entire life. They keep getting increasingly important. Um, so <laughs> if that's so and they say, like, if you are, um, you know, if God, the, I'm, I'm losing my train of thought here. Oh, yeah. So if that so the thing is, like, by that logic. We will never, ever vote for a third party, which means we are going to be stuck with something we ne never were stuck with in American history before, two permanent parties. I mean, previously, 
you know, there was there we there was a time in American history when there was no Democratic Party before Andrew Jackson came along. Be there was a time in American history before Abe Lincoln came along that there was no Republican Party. And so where did they come from? They these two parties, they were third parties originally. And they because people voted for them, they 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 wasted their votes. They contributed, they donated to them. These parties built up and eventually became major parties. Well, the very same people, who, I mean, Gary, Gail Collins acknowledges that Biden and Trump both suck. Well, if we think Biden and Trump and the Democrats and Republicans both suck, and we want an alternative under this system without a revolution, without tumbrils and guillotines, which you know I'm all for, but, we're, but, <laughs> the, but until we get there, um, the only way to do it is to build up third, fourth, fifth parties. And the only way you get third and fourth, fifth parties to become viable first or second parties is you have to vote for them and give money to them and put the sign in your lawn. That's the truth. You have to invest in the future. It's like, you know, it's like if you buy, if you bought crypto in the early, early days when people weren't really sure about it, you could get it for like, hundred bucks a, a coin, a Bitcoin. And then, you know, you may have been able to sell it for $50,000. You've got to invest early if you want like the possibility of something to pay off. You come into crypto when it's already $50,000. Well, you know, you missed this boat. We've got to invest in the future here. The, a third party vote is a vote for the future. A party for, a, a, for voting for a major party, even if you agree with that party. And I mean, it's your choice. But it is a vote for the past and for the status quo. And that's fine. You can vote for that. But you don't, people who want to support the status quo should not tell those of us who want something new that we don't have that right to support something new. Right. Or even disparage us that we're somehow, you know, un American or undemocratic, which is really bizarre. Or that we don't care, or, or that like this means you like Donald Trump. Or whatever. Yeah, exactly. Which, like I said, the Gary if I Johnson. I like Donald Trump. I I know exactly what I would do. I donate money to him and I would vote for him. Well, and there it the is. fact that I don't is because I don't like him. <laughs> there it is, right I mean, there. It's kindergarten politics, really. Okay, so we're going to cut this. We're going to make this kind of a shorty today. So uh, when we come back, we're going to talk about trials or lack thereof. Kafka would have loved this because you would have been waiting forever in a nebulous world where the trial never actually happens. Well, apparently that's America now. So we'll be back to talk about that right after this. Right, Ted? Yes, we will. Okay.